Thank you, and thanks for inviting me once again. I don't know what I can do to Murat to, so he doesn't invite me again, but I keep coming back. Um, uh, many of you in the audience probably know a little bit about Nementa, but some of you may not know about Nementa. So just briefly, uh, Nementa is a small, I represent Nementa, and uh, we are a uh, team of about 15 scientists and engineers here in Northern California, and we are uh, focused mostly on uh, theory, information theoretic sort of principles, how the neocortex works. Um, we also believe that those uh, theories in, will inform machine intelligence. My uh, talk today is a bit aspirational. Um, I'm going to do less on the details of uh, what we do in our modeling and talk more about the big picture uh, and make some suggestions about how we ought to be thinking about our work as a collective team. Um, as we all know, uh, you know, it's funny, 10 years ago when I started the Menta, the term AI was a really negative term. No one wanted to use that term for anything, and now it's become very much in vogue again. And uh, as well as machine learning and machine intelligence and so on, and um, and it's great. The progress it's been making recently is really really great. Um, but it, it, there is some fear that we may be getting off track. And and so I want to talk about today is what should we be shooting for? Not for a year from now or five years from now, but let's say um, 30 years from now or 100 years from now. What what should we the legacy we, we should be working towards? It doesn't mean it'll take that long, it's just that we ought to be thinking about what we ultimately want to get to. It may only take five years, but we ought to be thinking about the long term. There's some, things, there's some reasons to be worried about this uh, because the field of machine learning and deep learning and so on is a bit hyped these days. I, I, I became aware of this, uh, it really struck me once, there was a recent headline um, that said something along the lines of Microsoft uh, investing heavily in machine intelligence. The sub-headline was agreed to acquire um, swipe the keyboard, uh, predictive keyboard company. And that was the, the, the basically leading, that's a big investment in machine intelligence. So um, I don't think that's what machine intelligence is. And uh, so what I wanted to do today is I want to talk about what intelligence is. I want to take it from a perspective of biology um, and see what we can constrain the, our view about intelligence and then ask ourselves, well, what should we be doing when we're trying to build intelligent machines? Um, and so that's the title of my talk here, What is Intelligence That a Machine Might Have Some? Um, the talk will be right in the three sections. The bulk of it is this first section, which is basically going through the biological components of intelligence. We all agree, in fact, the only thing we all agree on is intelligent is a human, uh, human nervous system. And so uh, outside of that, there's disagreement. So we're gonna focus about that and say, what does that tell us what intelligence is? Then we can talk about what are the functional components of intelligence uh, that we can pick up from that. So take yourself outside of the biology, what are the functional components of that? And then finally, I'll talk a bit about uh, the diversity of intelligent machines. What might they look like in the future? Okay, let's just talk about the first one here. This is, I don't hope you can see that. This is a, a, a cartoon drawing of a, of a nervous system. I'm gonna use a lot of cartoon drawings here. Trust me, I know the complexity of the nervous system, but it's not worth putting it up in pictures here. Um, this is showing what a reptile brain might look like. Uh, uh, and, the, and the brain in the nervous system evolved hierarchically. So we started with a, a spinal cord, which has, by, by the way, has sensory uh, inputs and it has behaviors, reflex behaviors. And then on top of that, um, eventually evolved the brain stem, which is sort of mostly autonomic behaviors. Uh, that would be like, you know, if you have a blood pressure and, and gustatory functions, things like that. Eventually we added a system that add uh, what we might call midbrain structures in the human. That would be like cerebellum, bears the ganglia, things like that. And these are, um, these have basic, these emotions and basic behaviors and there can be learned behaviors. And then at the top of the reptile's brain, there's something called the pallium, which is very similar to the hippocampus in mammals. And it's a, it's a very fast memory of um, where the animal's been, so it can recognize where he's been before. Now, you can think about a reptile. A reptile is uh, pretty creative thing. Think about an alligator, for example. Uh, it has a lot of behaviors, um, and it has a lot of abilities to rear its children, and territorial fighting, and eating, and sex, and things like that. Um, and, uh, but what, what came along is that in mammals, we added one more component. Basically, all this was preserved. And in mammals, we added the neocortex. And the neocortex is uh, actually sandwiched between the hippocampus, logically, between the hippocampus and the rest of the brain. And it represents about 75% of the volume of a human brain. Not 75% of the cells, but 75% of the volumes. And it's pretty expensive. And a human, it's so big that we're the only species who uh, regularly die in, in childbirth. Now, we presented that now these days, but that's because we have such a big head, it doesn't fit through the birth canal. 
And uh, we also take our, two, our, our offspring can't even walk for about a year, and they can't really be able to do anything on their own for about four or five years, and it takes about 18 years for them to become fully mature. These are pretty expensive stuff. So there ought to be a good reason for having a neocortex, and, uh, and we should ask, what is it? I mean, what are we getting over the, 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 the reptile? Um, it better be pretty good. Now, if I wanted to try to summarize this in one word or one small phrase, I would say the following. I would say the neocortex learns a spatial, uh, uh, excuse me, a sensory motor model of the world. Um, and what do I mean by sensory motor model of the world? Um, it basically learns how the world is. It's the structure of the world. And it's a sensory motor model because mostly what it learns is how the world behaves when you act upon it. Now, remember, the world to the brain is just a bunch of patterns coming on the sensory organs. Uh, what you perceive is the model in your brain. It's not that the world, the brain doesn't actually uh, deal with that. Um, the brain has to construct that. So it basically says, when I act, what are the patterns that come in? And when I, when I act again, what are the patterns that come in? And we have to, through that interaction, we build this model of the world, which tells us how everything works, from computers to doors to food and cars and so on, and all the things we do every day. Uh, now, we have a pretty sophisticated model of the world, um, and that's what uh, really makes us tick. Let's just jump into that, and let's look at it in more detail. Now, if you look at the neocortex, everyone knows this. Or please, most people do. This is, uh, of course, the classic Feldman and Vanessa diagram from 1991. Um, the cortex itself is a sheet of cells, and it's, and it's divided into regions, and those regions are connected together in a hierarchy. This is the macaque monkey hierarchy. On the left, you see the somatosensory hierarchy. On the right, the, the uh, visual hierarchy. The little rectangles, if you're not familiar with this drawing, the little rectangles you can barely see are the cortical regions. And all the lines are the interconnections, massive interconnections between those regions. So those rep each one of those lines represents millions of nerve fibers going both ways, uh, forming a hierarchical representation, a hierarchical chart, if you will, of the, of the cortical regions. Information in this diagram would come in at the bottom and flow up the hierarchy and back down the hierarchy. You'll see that there's different hierarchies for the different modalities that are connected towards at the top. Now, the first thing we can say, this looks awfully complicated. Uh, Josh, how are we ever going to figure this out? Well, it's a hierarchy of regions, but as you heard and you know, and everyone here should know, that the regions are remarkably preserved. They're almost identical everywhere. They're not identical. There are differences. Some are noted. Some are very subtle. Um, but they're remarkably preserved. The regions have a lot of detail, and everywhere you look, that detail exists. This is, uh, and this, therefore, the, the, the basic consumption is all the regions are doing something very, very similar. That there's so much evidence for this, I don't want to debate it, although there are people who would like to debate it. Um, we're not going to debate that here today. The second thing we could argue is that, notice that the hierarchy itself varies significantly across species. So if I look at the visual hierarchy of a monkey and the visual hierarchy of a human and the visual hierarchy of a cat and a dog, they're all quite different. So there's nothing particular about this connected graph here. Um, it turns out that you can take these cortical regions and you hook them in different ways and they generally work pretty well. And we know from sensory substitution, you can put information in on the wrong type of information in one end of the hierarchy, and it still works. So we don't have to worry about the complexity of that Feldman vinesson diagram. What we need to worry about is what is each cortical region doing, how do they work in a hierarchy, and then later on, you can figure out what hierarchy you want to build. If we look at what each cortical region looks like, the first thing you see is it's structured as layers. Everywhere you see, there are layers of cells, typically six, depending on who's counting, but that's the typical number that people use. But they're very clearly there. There's no doubt about this. The second layer, a uh, second or part of organization of this, is that they are, there are these mini columns. The individual neurons, the excitatory neurons, are arranged in these mini columns. They, those are physically true. You can't always see them, but they're part of the development of the brain. And there's a lot of debate about whether they're functional. And a mini column is really skinny. It's only like 50 microns wide. It has about 100 to 120 cells in it. It's a very, very skinny column of cells as an organizing principle in the region cortex. Now, there's a few things that most, some people forget about, the, about the, the, these cortical regions. And let me tell you about them. The first is the input. We think of the input. Everyone knows, oh, there's some sensory input comes into the primary uh, visual cortex or the primary auditory cortex or whatever. And then the, that it gets passed to the next one and so on. But you, you need to remember, though, that that's not all. That's only half of what a region gets. The region also gets a copy of motor commands that are being executed by the rest of the brain, uh, either the subcortical or other parts of the brain. That is, it knows what behavior is being produced by somebody else at this point in time. And this is essential, because if you didn't have this, and the input changes on your retina, you'd think the, move, the world was moving. 
And you don't think the world is, move is, uh, world is moving when you move your eyes. It seems stable. And the only way that can happen is that you're, the, every region of cortex, and this is true for every region in the brain that we know of, it's getting both sensory input and copies of motor commands. And this is essential for how it in, understands the world because it, most of the changes on the sensory organs are because of your movement. Not all of them, but most of them. And therefore, this is what it's inferring. It's inferring both sensory data and motor be behavior. That's a, a common principle throughout the cortex. The second thing is that every region that we know of in the cortex has layer five cells that project out of the cortex and generate motor behavior. Everyone, even V1, has cells that project down the superior colliculus and in, in, in impact eye movement. Uh, so this is a universal property. That same output gets split in two and goes up to the next region in the hierarchy. So you actually, the next region is getting a copy of the motor behavior that this region is generating. And this is a general principle throughout the neocortex. Every region of the cortex also has cells in layer six which project back to the thalamus which are believed to be involved in attention. Now there's a lot more to this that I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna stop right here, but I want you to make some observations about this. Um, first of all, every region is recognizing sensory sequences. Um, so every region is getting the stream of data coming in, and just like my speeches right now, or if, or if you listen to some music, or if some of your bird was flying across or something, it's time-based sequences. And one of the types of sequences is just a pure sensory sequence, like my speech right now. And you have to infer that or recognize it by hearing it through time. It's, it's an inference over time. It is not a spatial inference. The second thing is that every region has to recognize sensory motor sequences. This is, again, when, when, you, when you feel something, if I put my hand down and I touch something, I know that because I know how I move my hand. It, the inference is both a combination of my motor behavior and what I'm sensing. And so this is the second type of inference that a, a region does. Every region generates motor sequences. So it builds a model of sensory data, sensory motor data, and it generates output. And you might argue that every region is doing what the entire cortex is doing. If the, if the cartridge cortex is trying to build a, a model of the world through sensory motor interaction, but that's what every region is doing, which makes sense. It's very copacetic, a very desirable thing. You, you know, the, these other, it's not like some property that comes out of the hierarchy. This is what every part of the neural tissue is doing. And when you hook them in hierarchies, you get some nice other properties. So this is basically the core item of, of understanding how the neocortex works is understanding how one of these regions works. And it's the same pretty much everywhere you go. These are the principles that exist everywhere. Now, we hypothesize, um, and I think it's, it's pretty strong, I'll say when you deduce, you can deduct, that to do these functions, you need to have memories of sequences. You need to have memory of how things change over time. My speech right now is layer five cells in one part of my neocortex firing in a complex pattern. And every word is a complex pattern. My phrases are complex patterns. I can repeat them. I can repeat them. I can say these sentences over and over again. I can give this talk twice. I have these sequences memorized. And I can put them together in complex ways. But it's all playing back sequences. And that has to be stored in cortical tissue. Similarly, when I recognize speech, or I recognize music, or I recognize anything, the visual parts of my world, I move about, I'm, 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 playing, I'm recognizing patterns I've learned before. These are all sequences of patterns, streaming data. So it's all about sequence memory here. This is the primary memory uh, of, of, a cortic, of the cortex, is how things change over time. And we have a theory about this, which is that every layer of cells is actually implementing sequence memory. Uh, and they, they reason they differ is because we're doing different things with them. So our current guess best, well, it's pretty clear that layer five cells are, are playing back motor sequences. Uh, our guess best about layer four, that they're learning sensory, sensory motor sequences, or inferring sensory motor sequences, not generating them, they're recognizing them. And layer three are recognizing pure sensory sequences. Um, I don't want to get into the details of that, but this is, this in some sense, you can deduce that these properties must exist in the cortex for you to understand the world. Um, now, how does that work? We have a theory great about this, exactly how this works, and I'll just give you the basics of it. I won't go into the details. First of all, we have to talk about neurons. Obviously, the brain is made of neurons. This is a pyramidal neuron. This is 80% of the excitatory cells in the brain. I just learned recently, by the way, that spiny stellate cells, for those of you who know who those are, are actually also pyramidal neurons that lost their apical dendrite. I didn't know that. Um, that, but so we can say pretty much this is the excitatory cell of the neocortex. Uh, 
Now we know that these cells have thousands of synapses. It varies, maybe 10. We know that up to 30,000 synapses on a pyramidal cell in the hippocampus. So these are huge numbers of synapses on these cells. And these, these synapses are expensive. Uh, they're not there for, they're there for a purpose. 10% of the synapses are near the cell body or proximal, and they're able to make the cell fire in the classic way we think about in neural networks. 90% of these synapses are so far away from the soma that if you activate one of them, it either has almost indetectable uh, or is indetectable at the soma. So it's very, very hard, and for many years people said, what the hell are they good for? What are 90% of these synapses doing if they don't really have any effect at the cell body? And we had some of this debate yesterday when Christoph Koch was here. So we now know that, of course, these synapses are all along the dendrites. There are no excitatory synapses on the soma. They're only on the dendrites. They're really chock-a-block. The spines are about a micron apart. And we now know that there are active properties to dendrites. So this work is from um, uh, Larka, Major, and Schiller. Um, but the basic idea here is if you have a number of synapses that are co-located on a dendritic uh, segment, they're within about 40 microns of each other, and you activate multiple ones at the same time, that they, can act, they, they sum non-linearly. Typically, the, we talk about an NMDA spike. They can generate an NMDA spike, which is a much larger depolarization and, and a longer depolarization, and it has a significant effect on the soma. An NMDA spike is very measurable at the soma. It's not sufficient to make the cell spike, but it is sufficient to make a significant depolarization. So this little diagram shows that the difference between going from seven spikes in blue and eight spikes, uh, seven synapses, and eight synapses activated in red. And it shows that nonlinear property. But as I said earlier, it's usually 15 to 20 synapses are required to create an NMDA spike. And the basic theory here is that that is a coincidence detector. You're detecting a pattern out in some larger neural uh, tissue uh, by detecting 15 to 20 synapses active at the same time, and you're going to recognize that, and you're going to put the cell into a depolarized state. If you follow that and you do the math in this, and this is all built on sparse representations that Rod was just talking about and that we've written about extensively, um, and others as well, um, that the neuron, each pyramidal neuron can recognize hundreds of unique and independent patterns on its dendrites. It's not recognizing you know, like one thing, it's like hundreds of them. And the basic theory you have is that most of those detection patterns are patterns that preceded the cell uh, becoming active, and therefore they're predictions. Their cell is saying, I have seen this pattern in the past, I typically become active afterwards, I'm going to depolarize, and I'm going to be in a more a prime state to fire when, if I do get input. So these are uh, the, the patterns on the, on the basal dendrites that depolarize the cell, and this is a form of prediction. Um, and the advantage of this is when the cell does become active, it's going to spike a little bit sooner than other cells that have similar input. And in some sense, the cells that are predicted will become active and inhibit other people, and you'll get a sparser activation when you have a correct prediction. And these are all observations that are shown, uh, known in the brain. I'm not going to go through exactly how this works, um, but I'm just going to give you some flavor of this. If you put a bunch of these neurons in a layer of cells, in a pretty, in, in a, in the columnar representation, you'll end up developing a very, very powerful sequence memory. And that's what we've been testing for many years now. Uh, and we, if you want to go the details of it, you can come to our poster. Um, I just want to point out that we model these, these neurons. This is a picture of our software model of these neurons. We, we have to model the individual dendrites. We have to model different integration zones, the apical, the basal, and the proximal. These are important. We have to model individual synapses. Um, but there's a lot of things we don't model. Uh, our neuron model is not a spiking model because we haven't found a need for that from an information theoretic point of view. Okay, we have, uh, just to give you a flavor of this if you haven't seen this, you have to have a representational scheme for how it is you represent information in sequences. Um, we, we walk us through these two, we use this sort of, a, this picture here is using like ABCD and XBCY because they have subsequences that are the same. And so if I show you XBC, uh, ABC and I've learned that sequence, I predict D. If I see you XBC, I have to predict Y. The point is that sequences are very complex in, in real data. I'm not going to walk you through this, but we have a, um, whoops, uh, I just leave it here. This, these little panels are representing how, in a layer of cells with columns, how would you represent inputs that are predicted and inputs that are not predicted and so on. It's really cool theory. I, I'd encourage you to learn about it. Come by the poster layer later. But it explains how a layer of cells can learn very complex sequences of any duration and merge them and separate them and, and making predictions constantly all the time and even make multiple predictions at the same time. I'm not going to walk you through that. Uh, it's beyond the point of this today's talk. We also modeled the apical synapses. This is the one at the bottom of this picture I want to talk about, though. 
In this model, learning is not by modification of synaptic weights. It's by synaptogenesis, which is a much more powerful form of learning, and we know this is going on all the time in the cortex. But we heard yesterday, it's a fact that individual synapses are largely stochastic. You cannot rely on from any amount of, of uh, fidelity. Even one digit is more than you can get out of a synapse. So forget it. If, you're, if your neural model requires one digit of precision, it's not going to work in a real neuron. Um, but if you learn sets of neurons at once, then you can get something. Like if you can learn 15 or 20, form new synapses, then you got something that's reliable. And that's what we think is going on. The way we learn in this system is we model growth instead of uh, heavy in type of learning, but we model the growth of synapses, not the synaptic weight change of synapses. Uh, when we know this is going on all the time. So in this picture on the left, you can see an axon and a dendrite, and we have something we call the synapse permanence, which represents the growth of the synapse. And at zero, there's no growth between these two, this axon and this dendrite. And then you start, and when I increase, when I train, I increase the permanence. At some point, you get to a threshold, in this case, 0.3, where you've actually formed the synapse, and it's now active. And then you can continue uh, 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 training the system. You, the strength of the synapse does not change. It's a binary synapse, but the permanence increases. Why would we do this? First of all, it kind of models what's going on in the biology, actually. But the importance of this is that you can start training on patterns before if you know they're real. They could be noise. You have to see it several times before it actually becomes an actionable thing. And then you can continue to train on it, making it much harder to forget. So something you've been exposed to over and over and over again is going to last longer a memory than something that's only been exposed to a few times. It allows us to do continuous learning in the, in the face of noise. You have constant noise coming in. The system's constantly trying to learn it, but it only acts when it's seen it multiple times. Uh, it's a very powerful form of, uh, form of learning. Uh, we've tested this and built these things out the wazoo. We've applied them to commercial products. Uh, I only want to just point out a couple of things. The top point here is showing the blue line that one of these HGM sequence memories, we call them HGM sequence memories, um, is learning uh, a predictive model, some complex data stream that's partly noise and partly structured data. And you can see we start, in, time is on the, on the uh, horizontal axis, we start feeding in a stream of data. There's no batch here. You just start training the system. And it starts getting up and it gets the perfect accuracy as it, the best it can do in this case at the top. Then at some point we change the data, it falls back in its accuracy and it learns again. There's no, it's constantly adjusting, constantly learning even as the data changes. The bottom one just shows that the systems are very, very robust. I'm only showing one type of robustness here. This is cell death. So if I train a system and then somewhere along the line I kill a bunch of the neurons, in this case, anything up to about 40% of the neurons is hardly noticeable. Um, after that, you can see a sharp drop off in the performance of the system. And even without all those neurons, it relearns how to do the same problem. Uh, it's an extremely robust system in every single way, neurons, synapses, dendrites. And this is an important property if you're ever going to build these things in hardware. OK, I now want to switch topics to the functional components of intelligence. I just gave you sort of the biological substrate, a system with a cortex and a hierarchy and a region, a region doing sequence memory and so on. So what are the functional components? This is Hawkins' list. This is my list because this is subjective. So uh, I'm just, I made this up, so that's why I call it Hawkins' list, the functional components. Uh, but I, I think it's a pretty good one. First of all, uh, I argue that if you're going to build an intelligent system, it's going to have to have networks of neurons that learn and recall sequences. That is its fundamental tissue premise that has to do this because all inference, almost all inference in auditory, visual, and uh, somatosensory is inference of sequences. All motor behavior is playing back sequences. This is not something to be added to a, a system. It is the core fundamental principle. Um, we've talked about some of the key principles. Continuous learning. It's not a batch system. It's got to be continuous learning to be an intelligent system. Um, I didn't go into this, but I'm going to argue it has to be, uh, make multiple simultaneous predictions, and it has to be very robust. Those are requirements, I believe, for an intelligent system. I propose one model for doing this. That model is the HCM model, which uses active dendrites, synaptic genesis, and no spikes. There might be other ways of doing this. We've been looking at LSTM. I believe this is how, how the brain does it, but it doesn't have to be how we implement this for an intelligent system. The second thing is we have to have regions that use sequence memory for sensory inference, sensory motor inference, and motor generation. And I think this is a fundamental requirement of intelligent machines or intelligent people. We don't do most of this stuff today. Then you have to have a hierarchy of regions. Now, the hierarchy is required, but there's a lot of parameters here. The number of regions is a parameter. 
The size of the region is a parameter. The connectivity graph is a parameter. You could have a system with one region or a system with 200 regions. You could have a system with a teeny little region, a system with big regions. That is a design parameter. It's not essential to the overall uh, uh, function of the system. It just, those are things you can dial it in for different types of applications. And then finally, this system, if we're modeling the neocortex, has to have an embodiment. It has to exist in something. And I made an argument, it has to exist with one or more sensors. It's got to have one or more built-in behaviors. These are behaviors that exist outside of the cortex in some sense, of so their body, the old behaviors, because the cortex controls the rest of the body. It has to have emotions and motivations. They can be very simple, or they can be complex. And it has to have a, uh, something equivalent um, for, uh, it, might, it might have something equivalent to like the hippocampus. I, actually, I shouldn't say it has to. It has to have an embodiment, but these individual parameters here, these individual things are parameters. You can have more or less different types. It's not like there's one size fits all. Okay, so that's, those are my functional requirements. So I think about we're gonna build intelligent machines in the future. Uh, uh, they're gonna have to do these things. So now let's talk about uh, the diversity of intelligent machines. If you accept this sort of list, Let's look at the things we can play around with. What are the parameters we can play with here? And what could that lead to us? Well, first of all, you realize you could build a system that works on the cortical principles, the principles of intelligence that are very small and very big. Yesterday, Bruno talked about tiny brains. He talked about insect brains. Those are not intelligent brains. But you can build small, tiny, intelligent brains. We have rats, we have mice, but we could even go smaller than that. In, in, at Nomenta, we build very small pieces of cortex of 65,000 neurons and several hundred million synapses. And those learn the spatial temporal data patterns and sensory data coming off of sensors on machines and, and, and buildings and things like that. They work on cortical principles, uh, but they're very, very small. Would I say it's super intelligent? No. But is it working on the intelligent principles? Yes, it is. And uh, so you can go from that variety. On the other hand, we could build things with very complex sensors that are unlike anything a human has. Um, and, and very big hierarchies and so on. I'm gonna leave you with two of my personal aspirational goals here. Uh, things I would like to see, I doubt I'll see them in my lifetime, but things I would like to see, and I think there's things that we can build using these principles. One is I would love to see a machine that is like a super mathematician, a super physicist. You can literally build a hierarchy that's designed where part of the hierarchy is, 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 and behaviors are mathematical behaviors, mathematical functions, or mathematical operations. And so the system operates in the space of mathematics. And it can, and you might have one section of the hierarchy dealing with topology and another section of the hierarchy dealing with another aspect of mathematics. And this system could be a super brain on mathematics. It could be huge and it could be fast and it could work nonstop 24 hours a day and have the right motivations. This is possible to do using these kind of principles. Another thing I'd love to see is that one day we're not gonna be able to live on this planet anymore. I hope it's a long time from now, but it might not be. And um, you know, Elon Musk is talking about sending people to Mars and so on, so is NASA. Well, you know, they're serious about that, but they think they're gonna send people there and the first thing they're gonna do is build you know, factories and mines and things like that. I, I, I don't think I'd want that job. So <laughs> we, we, need, we need to make super engineer scientists robots that go and do this stuff. This sounds crazy, I know that, but I'm not, I'm not joking. We need to be able to send milled machines that can actually solve engineering problems, solve construction problems. If we're ever gonna get off this planet, if we're ever gonna explore the rest of the solar system, we have to have machines that can do that because we are not gonna be able to, to survive in those environments. But why can't we make a machine that is really good at using tools, really is a good engineer, can sit there and solve problems and build things, and we can send it out in, in advance of us? It is crazy, but uh, I'm up, that's about done. But you know, we ought to be aspiring to something great. And uh, we shouldn't be settling for what we can do today. And so I, I've argued that these are the principles we need to go to embodiment, we need to go to this sensory motor inference, we need to build these complex models. There's a huge amount to do this, but it's not impossible, and we're making great progress on this. So that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Time for a couple questions. Sort of a quick one. Yeah. So birds have kind of have cortex. I mean, depends on who you talk to. They really have a cortical life. I notice you have reptiles and mammals. Yeah. What do you have to say about birds? Well, look. I I love all animals. It's a, it's a good uh, political statement. Um, 
you know, you know, you could ask me, well, what do you think about birds? What do you think about octopus, octopi? They have great brains, too. Um, there are a lot of structures here that are going to be shared in other animals. Um, you know, I remember, um, you know, bird brains, people study songbirds, and they have a very, very, very uh, rigid type of memory. Uh, but then uh, there was, what was the name of the woman who studies the, the parrots? Um, yeah, what's her name? Yeah, pepper, pepper, pepper something. Yeah, Pepperberg. Uh, and she, she argues that great parrots are like super smart. Well, maybe they are. Um, I'm not arguing these principles don't exist in other brain structures. They probably do. But, um, and so that's great. I just say we should be, we should be shooting for first understanding the, the mammalian neocortex because it is the one thing we can all agree is intelligent. Yeah, Yosef. Um, you say uh, you, don't, you don't use spiking. Do you have a form of timing dependent plasticity? Yeah, it's the question is do we, we don't use spiking. Uh, do we have a form of timing dependent plasticity? In some sense we do. Um, you realize uh, there's a lot of, remember I said earlier on that everything we do is very biological. Did I say this? I should have said this, we didn't. Our models are very biological. Um, uh, we do not want to be biologically inspired. We want to be biologically constrained. So every model we have, we have to ask how is this really working in neural tissue? And um, and so spikes exist in neural tissue, and spike timing dependent plasticity exists in neural tissue. And we have, to, even, if we're, even if we're not modeling spikes, we have to explain why we're not modeling spikes, because they're not inf essential from information theoretic point of view. Um, in terms of spike timing, uh, timing uh, plasticity, there are a lot of aspects of, things, of this model are very timing dependent. Uh, how a, a, a cell fires uh, and inhibits other cells. In this particular case, Learning in the system occurs from a back action potential traveling up the dendritic um, uh, tree. And we actually only want learning to occur in the segments that have been depolarized because they had sufficient input. We don't want to actually learn all over the system. We want to learn localized to different parts of the dendrites. And we only really want to think about form synapses to things that were active just moments before the cell generated an action potential. So I have a pattern that exists in the world uh, in this neural tissue, and then I have the cell spiked. I do the back action potential, and then I do training. If that signal, if that context in the world came afterwards in the wrong side of spike timing dependent plasticity, I wouldn't want to learn it. It wouldn't have been predictive. So the whole idea is you want to have a predictive signal occurring right before the cell fires. That's what you want to learn. You don't want to, so that, that timing is there. We don't, the way we implement our systems uh, in software, we don't actually have to encode that specifically, but it, the concept's there. So, but it makes sense logically as well. I have a quick but uh, more phil philosophical question, which I really want to, to hear your answer for. So suppose you, we create the super intelligence and uh, engineers that you sent on Mars. Uh, the question is, why do these robots or intelligent robots would need us humans then? Would they, what, why would they? Why, why would they need us? Why would they you? need us? First of all, I never use the word super intelligent, so be careful about that. Uh, I wrote a nice uh, blog about this, or an uh, opinion piece about this. On, you can find it on Recode. And this is about the, the, the dangers of this. Remember I talked about there's parts of this, uh, I took it off the screen now, but there's parts of this, the, the, there was like the, the emotions and the motivations, right? Um, there's two, so there's two answers to your questions. One is we get to decide what the motivations and, and, um, and emotions of these systems are, if anything. Um, so uh, they will not have the same emotions you and I have. We also do not make them self-replicating. There's no reason these things have to be self-replicating. They're not going to have sex and you know, out on Mars. <laughs> Um, so, so, I mean, what is the worry? The worry is, well, uh, you know, uh, A, there's two basic worries. that these things get out of control and just have to do what they want to do? Well, they're not going to do that. It's kind of, they're just very simple things that just learn. The, it's, like, it's like building a human without the rest of the, the emotional structure. Then you know, the world would be a lot more logical and simple that way. Um, but these systems are not going to have those emotional frameworks. They're not going to be angry or thirsty or lust or whatever this is. And, um, and they're also not going to self-replicate. So I don't worry about that as much. But you can read the piece I wrote in Recode about it. Thank you.